Lord God, it is good to be here. We have been so privileged and blessed to be able to come here today, be with one another, but most of all, to come here and be with you. I imagine you, Sabbath morning, with anticipation, even though you know we're going to come, just waiting to see us walk through those doors and know that we are going to be worshiping you. And so Lord, as we do that just now, as we take a few minutes to look into your word and to think about what it is we're about as Christians, may your Holy Spirit lead and guide us as we open our hearts and minds to you. Is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. So how many of you have ever sung in a choir? Put your hand right up. All right, because this morning people were very timid. And I don't have a whole bunch of people who I know can raise their hands behind me anymore. All right. A number of you have. I realize that singing is not everybody's favorite activity, but for me, I have always enjoyed singing with a choir. And I remember when I was in elementary school, they started a, a school choir when I was in grade six. So I was able to sing with that choir for grade six, and grade seven, and then grade eight. And then when I got to high school, for some reason, I don't know why, I, I didn't join the choir. I don't know why I didn't. I did take voice lessons in grades 11 and 12. So if you think I sing bad now, you should have heard me before that. That's what some people told me. They said, man, you were really bad. But I didn't join the choir until grade 13. You know grade 13, that nice Ontario thing back in the day, kind of their version of your first year of college? Sort of, in the right situation, it might count for your first year of college. So I didn't join until grade 13. But after joining the choir again in grade 13, I wondered why I hadn't done so sooner, because again, I found that I really enjoyed it. You know what I found out when I came to Willowdale? So I joined the Kingsway College Choir in grade 13. We did some fun things. We, we performed the Messiah with the Oshawa, Sym the Oshawa Symphony, and also with the Crawford Adventist Academy Choir. And then later on, an amazing thing happened. The Kingsway Choir and the Crawford Choir, you know, like mortal enemies, we actually went on tour together to Quebec. We sang in Quebec. And I found out after I came here that, that uh, my enemy ward was in that choir. And I was in the Kingsway Choir. So we actually sang together a long time ago. I don't remember him. He doesn't remember me. Apparently, neither of us were very significant, but uh, we, we've been singing together for a long time. But it was fun. It was fun. A lot of good memories. When I went to Canadian Union College in Alberta, I sang with the choir each of the three years that I attended school there. In fact, the choir was a, a very good place because it was one of the first places that I met and got to know this gorgeous babe, I mean, this young lady that I eventually <laughs> married. Really, it was in the choir, and it was right at the beginning, and they were voting officers for the choir, and this, this girl, Sandy, she nominated me to be a part of the executive, because she was on it, and I thought, oh yeah, I think she likes me. <laughs> Worked out pretty good, I enjoyed the choir. I went to the seminary, Sandra and I sang with the seminary chorus, had a fun time with that, and in the years since, I've sung with different church choirs and smaller vocal groups. It's fun. Being part of a choir is fun, not just because of the singing, but also because of the friendships and the memories that you develop. And those memories are especially collected when a choir goes on tour together. You ever been on a choir tour? You spend a lot of time with people, sometimes too much time with people, but you, you do develop some, some good memories. Or when you put on a special program, then a choir draws a little bit closer. And of course, there's just something nice about, you know, belonging to a group, being part of its history, part of its heritage. So whenever the choir from my high school or my college, university comes to perform where I live, I feel kind of proud. I kind of have a, I feel like I have a connection with them. You know, I, I may know hardly anybody in the, I may not know anybody in the choir, but I'm still like, hey, those are my people. That's, that's my choir. You know, last year or a couple of years ago when the Kingsway College Choir was here singing, I'm like, that's my choir. Arnold John told me this morning that he used to sing in the Kingsway College Choir, like way back, way back. And coming up, I think it's the, I think it's May 3, it's the first Monday in May 
the Berman University Choir is going to be here at Willowdale to do a performance for us, a, a concert for us. And I don't know, they were always called the CUC Singers. Now they can't be called the CUC Singers. It's kind of sad, but they're still my choir. I'm going to be proud. I'm going to be like, that's my choir. Now look at me and say, that's some old guy, but I'm still, that's my choir. You feel a connection. Today I would like us to think about reunions and friendships. Now when I think about this, there are only two main reunion events that I can actually recall attending. One was just last year when I had the privilege of speaking for the Kingsway College Alumni Weekend on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of my graduating high school class. Who could imagine that we were so old? But, you know, I got to say, I thought, you know, this will be nice, but truthfully, that turned out to be a lot more enjoyable than I was expecting it to be. It was really fun to see and catch up with old classmates. It was particularly fun to connect with friends that I hadn't seen in years, some of them. So that was one reunion I remember going to. The only other one I really remember going to attending was way back in 1997 when Sandra and I attended the 20-year reunion of the CUC Singers, which was our, our college university choir. That time I had the privilege of speaking for the Friday Night Vespers program, and, and that was fun. You know, we were kind of thinking, do we want to go all the way from Saskatchewan to Alberta? Do we want to drive all the way for that? But I'm glad we did. It was, it was really a good event. And what was really amazing about that was being able to sing with such a large choir. You know, Flora said this morning in first service that our choir here, our church choir, has 31 members. That's pretty good. But at that reunion event, with the current choir joined by all the visiting choir alumni, we had a combined choir of about 200 voices. That's a choir. Let me tell you, there is just something grand and awesome about singing with such a, a powerful and talented choir. I mean, you can, you can create some power with 200 voices that you can't do with a small group, even with microphones. And especially when you're singing in worship to God. I mean, man, that was, a, that was truly a majestic experience. I'll never forget that. Reunions. You know, when you're planning to attend a reunion, it tends to get you thinking in, in two different directions. On the one hand, it naturally gets you thinking back to the past as you sort through the, the memories and the friendships that you've collected with the, the group that you're going to reunite with. You end up thinking that way, but you also, on the other hand, ha can't help having your thoughts directed to the future because you're filled with that anticipation of, you know, wondering, I wonder who's going to be there. I wonder if this person's going to be there, if that person. And I wonder how they will have changed. I wonder how they will have stayed the same. I wonder if they look older than I do. All that stuff that was better before social media. Takes you in two directions. Reunions, friendship. Now you may have never sung with the choir. In fact, you may have no desire to ever do so. But I think probably most of us here can relate to the idea of a reunion, right? Probably many, if not most of you, have had a chance to attend some type of reunion in your lifetimes. Maybe if you're really young, you haven't yet. But you will probably get the chance sometime in the future. There's all kinds of reunions. You've got class reunions and club reunions and staff reunions and team reunions. And of course, one fairly common type of reunion is the family reunion. So as I noted before, reunions, they get people thinking back about special times from the past as they look forward to meeting special people in the future. And really, if you think about it, if you think about it, isn't that what the Easter season is all about, reflecting back on the memory of a very special act of friendship as we look forward in anticipation to a future meeting with a very special friend. Isn't that really what it's about? You see, reunions are valuable because they bring people together who have something in common. They may, maybe they're all related, a family reunion, maybe they've all gone to school together, maybe they've all worked in the same place, maybe they've served their country together, whatever the case might be, they have something in common. And what's interesting about reunions is in many cases, you may not necessarily remember or you might not even know all of the people who come to the reunion, but you're still connected because you know that you have something in common with them. You know, sometimes I hear people talking about going to family reunions, and they say, you know, oh, there was 
200 people or maybe 300 people at our family reunion. I've heard Pastor Roshman talk about the Jurians reunion. Keith was here in, in first service and says you go in and there's this wall with this tree of all the hundreds of, of Jurianses and you, you've got to find yourself on the tree and mark that you were there. And, and people tell me about these great big reunions and what often happens I find is, you know, they say I went to this reunion and then they, they kind of shake their heads with a bewildered look on their face and they say, you know, I just, I don't know, I just, I wasn't able to keep track of who everybody was. Well, no kidding, 300 relatives? Who wants 300 relatives? I mean, I don't know. Actually, I do remember attending one other reunion. One time the Godsos had a family reunion in New Brunswick. I remember that. I don't know, I think I was maybe like maybe 12 or 13 or something like that. We had a, we had a whopping total of about 25 people at the Godso reunion. And I'm telling you, there were people there that I didn't even know who they were. I'd never heard of them before. So if your family's too big, just become a godso. Then it, it'll be easy to keep track. When it comes to reunions, it's, it's fun to recall the pleasant memories. It's nice to meet people with whom you have something in common. But I think the best thing about reunions is the anticipation of being able to see friends and family. Isn't that what, what makes it most interesting? I can't imagine a reunion being very enjoyable if I didn't know anybody there. You know, Sandra's mom was always trying to get us to go to some reunion of some branch of her family. Didn't know a soul. It was not very appealing to me. I never actually went. I was like, why do I want to go meet all these people? I don't know who they are. I'd rather go to a reunion where I can say, oh yeah, I remember, you know. I think it's the friends and family who we look forward to seeing at a reunion that really make the reunion special for us. And that means that if one or some of those friends and family members aren't there, it's disappointing, right? Disappointing for the ones that are there. Their absence takes away a little bit of what makes the reunion special. Now, this is a special season of the year for Christians. I like the amusing way I once heard W. Frank Harrington put it in a sermon. I wrote this down because I thought it was kind of an interesting way to put it. He said, Easter is the time of year when the Christian alumni come back to visit church. Well, that was interesting. The Christian alumni, you know, making a brief appearance just to check up on everyone. But it is true that at this time of the year, Christians around the world remember in a special way the tragic and yet amazing death of our Savior Jesus Christ. And along with remembering his loving death for us, This is a time when we especially celebrate his glorious resurrection. For he did come back from death. He conquered death and he lives today for us so that you and I can have the wonderful hope and assurance of eternal life. Don't take it for granted. It's a pretty cool thing. Because he was raised, we can look forward to a future day of resurrection. So on this special Sabbath, as we think about reunions and friends, I want to direct your attention to the most important friend. At least he's someone who very much wants to be your friend. And of course, I'm talking about Jesus. This friend that we remember and we celebrate and we honor and we worship today. My sincere wish would be that every single person, for everybody here, that we would be enjoying a personal friendship with Jesus right now. That's what I would wish would be the case. But is it the case? Maybe not all of you have actually experienced such a friendship with the Lord. In fact, I hope at church there's some people that haven't experienced a friendship with the Lord. I hope there's people that are maybe looking at that opportunity. And perhaps some of you once knew him, but the truth is, you've kind of drifted apart. And in reality, you don't seem to really have much in common with him anymore. So today, I would simply like to remind us a little bit about this divine friend. Because you know, with time and distance apart and with changes in interest, even in spite of social media, some friendships, they just sort of naturally die out, right? But when it comes to Jesus, I want to say to you that he never loses interest in being friends with you. We may move away from Jesus, but I'm telling you that he never moves away from us. 
No matter what you've done, no matter how long you've neglected the friendship, he is still ridiculously interested in a relationship with you, a friendship with you. That's pretty good. So let's think about this a little bit. If you have a Bible available to you, find James chapter 2, verse 23, near the back of the Bible. James 2, verse 23. Thinking about friendship with God. And yeah, you can look at the screen, but someday the power might be out, and it never hurts to actually know where to find something in a, in a book. Just as a safety measure. James chapter 2, verse 23. Friendship with God. James 2.23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And then it says, And he, Abraham, was called the friend of God. Isn't that amazing? The friend of God. Abraham being called God's friend. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, he is called God's friend forever. Where is my daughter? You know, people of my daughter's age, I find, if I'm hanging out over there, that, you know, they can have a different BFF like every three minutes. Oh, you're my BFF. Oh, no, you're my BFF. And I say, wait a minute, if that's your BFF, best friend forever, how can this be your best friend forever? Because you can only have one best friend forever. And if it was forever, how come three minutes later it's somebody else? I don't understand that. But I'm not a little girl. I know there's lots of things I don't understand. But in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, he is called God's friend forever. Pretty amazing. In Isaiah 41, 8, God is quoted as calling Abraham my friend. And then along with that, in Exodus 33, 11, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. But is this idea of friendship with God just something for the, uh, the patriarchs of the past? Not at all. Not at all. Still got your Bible? Take a look at John chapter 15, verse 15. Go back to the Gospel of John chapter 15 and verse 15. This is really beautiful. This is Jesus talking to his disciples about friendship. Look at what he says. John 15, verse 15. Jesus said to them these words. He said, No longer... Do I call you servants? For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. I believe that Jesus is just as eager, just as interested in being your friend today and being my friend today as he was way in days past, just as interested as he was in being a friend with Abraham and a friend with Moses and a friend with the disciples, so he wants to be our friend today. What kind of a friend is he? He's the ultimate friend. He's my best friend. I'm not always such a great friend to him. He's my best friend. And he's a true friend. You know what? A true friend is being defined by someone as one who knows all about you and loves you just the same. Isn't that the kind of friend God is? Jesus is? Another definition of a true friend is one who comes in When the whole world has gone out. Isn't that a true friend? Add to that the words of Proverbs 17, 17, which say that a friend loves at all times. And then Jesus, I think, really hit the essence of what true friendship is about when he said in John 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. This is the kind of friend that Jesus is. You plain and simply cannot find a better friend more loyal, more loving friend than Jesus. You may have heard or you may have read the story of the soldier in World War I who asked his officer if he might go out into the no man's land between the trenches and bring in one of his comrades who lay there terribly wounded. Well, you can go, said the officer, but it's not worth it. Your friend is probably killed, and you will just throw away your own life too. But the man went, you know, zigging and zagging, crawling and stumbling, desperately trying to dodge the explosions and the crossfire, and somehow, miraculously, he managed to get to his friend 
hoist him up on his shoulders and bring him back to the trenches where the two of them tumbled in together and lay there now in the bottom of the trench. And the officer looked very tenderly on the would-be rescuer. Then he said, I told you, it wouldn't be worth it. I mean, your friend is dead. Now you are mortally wounded as well. It was worth it, though, sir, the young man replied. How do you mean worth it, responded the officer. I'm I'm telling you, your friend is dead. Yes, sir, the boy answered, but it was worth it. Because when I got to him, he was still alive. And he said, Jim, I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. My friends, Jesus has already proved his love for us. He's proved himself the truest of friends by coming to this no man's land planet that we live on to save us. And in doing so, he sacrificed himself on a cross for you and for me. But unlike the story of the soldiers, Jesus came in time to save us. That's a big difference. He is the greatest of friends. Proverbs 18.24 refers to a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The neat thing about friendship with Christ is that he actually also becomes our brother. So this is really cool. Friendship becomes family. So why is it so important to keep up or to renew or to develop this friendship with Jesus? Why is it important? I think because there is a major reunion plan. This is, this is a reunion of cosmic proportions. It's going to be the ultimate reunion. No Jurian's reunion can come close to this thing. This reunion is going to outdo any reunion you've ever been to before. There will be a light show like you can't imagine, a banquet beyond, beyond description. This is going to be a reunion. And God's plan is that every single person would come to this reunion. But as with most reunions, Unfortunately, not everybody is going to make it. Not everybody is going to show up. And that means that for those present, there will be disappointment and sadness over family and friends who are missing. We talked about that in our Sabbath school lesson today. It's going to be a reunion, and it's always a, little, it's always a lot sad when some aren't there, especially for this one. And I think the best part of that reunion is not the party or the banquet or whatever, but it's seeing their friend Jesus face to face. That's what makes reunions special. It's a reunion of Jesus with his friends, and thus it becomes a family reunion, a reunion of the family of God. The people gathered together, they they won't remember everybody. They won't know most of the people there, but they will know that they have something in common. Every single one has a friendship with Jesus. And that means that they will all be family. And because Jesus is alive, even those who have died in Christ's friendship will be resurrected to join in this forever reunion. You know, choirs go on tour. I think what's going to happen is all these friends who have been gathered together, they're going to go on tour together. It's like the the We're Alive Universe Tour. Maybe we'll get t-shirts or something, you know, with an itinerary on the back. I don't know. You know, I was trying to think about this idea of choirs. As far as I can tell, the first mention in the Bible of a human choir that I can find seems to be in Exodus 15, where Moses and the Israelites sang what we call the Song of Moses, right? They sang it to the Lord after they'd been delivered from the Egyptians at the Red Sea. And as we think of the hope and the promises and the victory that has been given to God's people in the death and resurrection of Jesus, there are parts of this song written so long ago that seem very appropriate for us as Christians today. And we find this song of praise in Exodus chapter 15. I want you to just look at a a little bit of this song. Exodus chapter 15, second book of the Bible. Think about how this so ancient and yet so amazingly relevant for followers of God today, the song of Moses. Let's look at a little bit of this. Jump into the song, not at the beginning. Look at verse 2. See if this fits. Exodus 15, verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. 
And this is the time of the year when we celebrate the Lord's salvation. Is this applicable to us? Yes. Move down to verse 13. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. Go down to the end of the psalm in verse, the song in verses 17 and 18, where I imagine it really crescendos to a, a great swell. And it says, You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. It's a song we could still sing. Because of our Savior's death and resurrection, we have the hope and the assurance of being reunited with Him, living forever with Him in a place that He has prepared for us. Is that old hat to you? We have the opportunity to live together with Him in a place that He has prepared for us. It won't hurt you. Say amen. I think it's interesting that the last place in the Bible where a choir performance is mentioned, is also at chapter 15, but in this case it's Revelation chapter 15. And there it speaks of the redeemed standing on the sea of glass in heaven, singing praises to God. And what's interesting is the choir's repertoire has now expanded. It doesn't just include the song of Moses, but there's another song now called the Song of the Lamb. You know what? I have had the privilege and the enjoyment of singing with choirs in many nice places all across North America. I have literally sung with choirs from British Columbia to Florida and from Newfoundland to Texas. But I'll tell you what, the choir concert that I'm most looking forward to being a part of is a choir concert that's going to happen in the most beautiful place of all, on the sea of glass, standing before God's presence, singing praise to Him, the song of the redeemed. Man, I want to be in that choir. I want to sing in that one. So you know what? Even if you've never sung with a choir, maybe you currently couldn't carry a tune in a bucket if your life depended on it. That's Claudette is testifying. That's okay. Because you can forward, you can look forward to singing in that heavenly choir. doesn't matter what your skills are now. You can look forward to that at this important time of the year during this Easter season. I want to encourage you and myself to think about our friendship with Jesus, really. And I want to say, make some good memories now with Him so that you can really look forward to an awesome reunion that He is planning. Reunions are a lot better when you've got some memories to, to review when you get together. So create some memories now. Because who knows? In fact, it's very unlikely. Here we are However many people we are right here, right now, the deacons have counted, but I don't know what it is. How likely is it that this exact group of people is ever going to meet on earth again together? Frankly, not very likely. But it doesn't really matter, even if we don't, because we can anticipate meeting together at that ultimate reunion when Jesus comes to take us home to heaven. I want to ask you, are you and Jesus friends? How's your friendship with Jesus? How's the friendship going? I want to encourage you to keep up your friendship with Jesus. If that's your situation. And I want to encourage you to renew your friendship with Jesus. If that's your situation. And I especially want to encourage you to start up a friendship with Jesus. If that's your situation. If you've never tried out friendship with Jesus, you need to give it a try. Because it's, it's a good friendship. So please, please choose to be a friend with Jesus. And then I can look forward to singing with you on the sea of glass. You can look for me. My plan is I'm going to be singing in the contrabass section. I don't know if God's going to allow that, but that's my plan. So, you know, wave at me, and we'll sing together. Praise God. Because that's what we celebrated this season. Now, are you ready to sing? You better be ready to sing, I hope. Let's sing together. This might be new for some people. It's number 252, is that right? 252, hymn called, Come Let Us Sing. 
We don't have to wait for the sea of glass. We can start practicing now. So let's sing together. Sing to your friend Jesus.